Hi everyone, my name is Matt Jarbo. Welcome back to another episode of Deep Lore, the show that covers the weird, the wild, and of course the WTF. Today we're going to be taking a bit of a departure from true crime and cover one of those WTF stories. I want to talk about the untold story of bum fights. And if you aren't aware of what bum fights is, you will be if you listen to this podcast. But this is something that was big in the San Diego area back in the early 2000s when I was in college, actually, is when I first heard of this. And it took place not far away from where I lived. I lived in Lakeside, which is in San Diego County. And this began in La Mesa, which was also in San Diego County and only a few minutes away from where I lived. So this story, when it was circulating its way around my neck of the woods, was fascinating. It was the story of a bunch of bums who were being paid to beat the ever-loving crap out of each other. But that was only a part of it, and it was even a part that was kind of propaganda-ish, and ultimately not even really real when we break down what actually went down. So for this episode of Deep Lore, we're going to be talking about bum fights, its creator, how it came to be, and of course the very odd aftermath which saw its creator in a bit of trouble in Thailand after being accused of stealing baby parts. It's, it's definitely a story. And of course, if you guys want to read along, you can always head over to deeplore.tv. I post a new article over there every single day. And over on youtube.com forward slash deep lore, I do audio recordings of the articles that aren't turned into podcast episodes. So you guys can go and check that out if you just want to put on my voice and listen to me tell you some tales. So why don't we talk about the origins of bum fights and its creator, a man by the name of Ryan McPherson. Ryan McPherson, a name that would become synonymous with controversy, was at the center of the production of the infamous video series Bum Fights. Born in La Mesa, California in 1983, McPherson had an early fascination with filmmaking and a drive for pushing boundaries. During his teenage years, McPherson formed an unlikely connection with two middle-aged homeless men named Donnie Brennan and Rufus Hanna. Hearing tales of their wild antics and amateur stunts, McPherson's curiosity was piqued, and at the age of 13, he decided to document their unconventional lifestyle, capturing their day-to-day -day lives and the various stunts performed by Rufus, who had gained local notoriety as the stunt bum. You have to love that this kid at the age of 13 was all about exploitation. You know, and it's not to say that like the bums in San Diego are different than anywhere else. They're, they're pretty standard across the board. But Rufus is one that had a very compelling look, a very compelling personality. And that is one of the reasons why people were drawn to him when he was the stunt bum. And of course, why he was so popularized when he became the face of bum fights. It's pretty wild when you kind of think about it. Now, initially, McPherson's footage of Brennan and Hannah was intended for only personal use, providing a glimpse into the lives of these individuals on the fringes of society. However, the potential for something greater began to take shape. Seeing the popularity of similar tapes circulating amongst his peers, McPherson saw an opportunity to create a unique and controversial project. Now, one of the things that they're talking about with this is not necessarily seeing bums or the homeless doing dangerous stunts. What they're talking about are fight tapes and fight tapes were, you know, making their way around quite a bit back in the day. These were ones that were clearly shot on either like mini DV or VHSC tapes, but they were circulated around and people just kind of saw them pop up in different places whether a friend had a VHS copy or it might have been on Google video or something like that. Maybe it was on live leak or one of those early type sites that showcased it all, all the, you know, stuff nowadays, what they have is um world star. So if you know anything about world star, that's where a lot of this footage probably would have gone if it wasn't for bum fights. And of course, many, many, many years down the road. So anyway, he teamed up with friends Zachary Bubeck, Daniel J. Tanner, and Michael Sliman, and it was here that McPherson formed a production company called In Decline. They were inspired by the raw and often shocking content of the MTV series Jackass, and the group decided to compile their footage onto a DVD release, giving birth 
to the very first bum fights. Now, bum fights became an audacious blend of street fights caught on tape and homeless men performing outrageous stunts. However, it is important to note that despite the provocative title, the video did not actually depict homeless men physically fighting each other. Instead, they showcased a compilation of street fights captured on tape and the participation of homeless individuals in skits and stunts. There's even a half-naked woman in in the in in the first video, the first one that came out, which was called Bum Fights Volume 1: A Cause for Concern. This one was initially released in 2001 and it immediately sparked controversy and drew the attention of both supporters and vehement critics. The videos gained notoriety for their shocking content and unfiltered portrayal of raw street life. This unconventional project struck a nerve, dividing audiences and raising ethical questions about the exploitation of vulnerable individuals. So as a San Diegan who was 19 when this first came out, I can generally tell you the vibe going around town in those circles was, holy hell, how do I get a copy of this? I want to see bums beat the shit out of each other because it's funny. Now, in retrospect, in hindsight, two decades removed, clearly that's not the right course of action. But when you are younger, when you're hearing about these things coming out of not only your city, but there's being clips circulated around on the internet and people are talking about it. And this is in the early, early days of social media. I mean, it was nowhere near what it is now, but people were talking back then and stuff did get shared around that nowadays would be seen as being uncouth or unpopular. I mean, look, to be fair, that stuff still gets shared around anyway, but it's largely more under the table and not as publicized as it once was. You could probably expect in like 2003, 2004, there would be bum fights posts all over MySpace when that was hitting the height of its popularity. So it was kind of a thing where people just heard about a movie called Bum Fights and they would immediately assume, hey, yeah, these are where bums are going to go beat the crap out of each other. How do I watch it? And that's one of the reasons why, because of the controversy, it quickly gained traction captivating audiences with its blend of shock value and dark humor. The series resonated with a generation drawn into the unconventional and edgy. By tapping into the spirit of rebellion, bum fights became a cultural phenomenon, attracting a significant following and igniting intense discussions about the boundaries of entertainment and morality. Keep in mind, this is 20 years ago. This is absolutely 20 years ago. When we didn't think about this kind of stuff, when I was in high school, websites like rotten.com and goregallery.com were popular. We would check them out all the time. This was a new phenomenon, a new tool, and people were using it to kind of look at the most dark and depraved content they could find on the open internet. I mean, within reason, obviously within reason. You know, it was like sex and like death stuff. There was a website called Style Project that featured both very heavily. And it was a really popular place for a lot of these people to hang out, message boards, forums, things like that. That is one of the reasons why people were really paying attention. We're in a new millennium. We're at new technology. There's all of this conversation around what is good, what is just, what is right, what is evil. And it was just this weird macabre blend happening that it's not there now because the internet's mainstream all of this stuff is mainstream so there's safeguards in place and there's there's people who who know what could happen if it's left unchecked and that's kind of where bum fights got popular and quite frankly it got too popular now with its unconventional approach and boundary pushing content bum fights quickly gained notoriety and captured the attention of audiences across the united states Bum Fights presented viewers with a raw and unfiltered look at street life, featuring a compilation of street fights caught on tape and homeless individuals engaging in outrageous stunts. Advocacy groups and critics condemned the videos for their perceived exploitation of vulnerable individuals. They argued that the series not only perpetuated harmful stereotypes about homelessness, but also glamorized violence for entertainment purposes. To be fair, what doesn't glamorize violence for entertainment purposes. I mean, 
I used to work at a movie theater back then. In fact, it was in San Diego at the Santee Drive-In. We would have parents bring their kids to hardcore R-rated movies, and I would be at the box office, and I would tell them, hey, uh, you know this movie is not meant for kids. It's a lot of violence, gore, nudity, and stuff. And the parents would say, yeah, the kids see worse on TV, which at the time is largely not true. But again, glamorizing violence for entertainment purposes is kind of what the video game industry is. And I'm not knocking the video game industry. I love games. I play all the time, but it's not something that can really be used as an argument nowadays and even probably ever. But 20 years ago, people were really trying to. However, despite the backlash, the popularity of bump fights soared. By 2002, the series had sold an astounding 250,000 copies of the first volume alone, each one priced at $22. Its sales figures and merchandise revenue reached unprecedented heights, firmly establishing bump fights as a cultural phenomenon. The controversial series found a significant following, with viewers drawn to its gritty authenticity and provocative nature. A lot of that was the word of mouth from it, right? It really was. It was like, watch these bums do crazy bum stuff. And it was just something you didn't see at the time. It was just something that didn't exist really in many places. I'm sure that when this blew up between, you know, 2001 and 2002, there were probably a fair amount of copycats, but this was also around the Girls Gone Wild time. I mean, Girls Gone Wild had been around for many years before this, but the idea of kind of just taking a camera out into the wild and capturing some audacious stuff, whether it be sex or violence, is going to draw an audience of people who don't have access to high to, to fast speeds of the broadband internet. They don't have, they don't have all that stuff. So they're still going to find themselves not being drawn in to what the internet can offer you just from the comfort of your own home, but they're going to be drawn into getting something because it, it's a unique purchase and one that not many people are going to get. Remember when faces of death was a thing? And people would see those at video stores and think, oh my God, they have a movie where people are really dying. I mean, sure, it, it's not actually real, but the legend supersedes any reality. Even now, right now in 2023, they're remaking Faces of Death for theatrical release. It's all fake, but they know that it's going to be so provocative that people are going to rush out to go see it. Why? Curiosity. So capitalizing on the success of the initial release, the four original founders of Bump Fights decided to sell the business for a whopping $1.5 million in 2002. Two Las Vegas businessmen known by the pseudonyms Ty Beeson and Ray Letitia became the new owners of Bump Fights. This transaction marked a turning point for the series as McPherson and his original team severed ties with the project. Under the new ownership, three more volumes of Bun Fights were released, featuring additional footage that had been acquired as part of the purchase. However, the new iteration of the series didn't involve McPherson or the original collaborators, and this development sparked further controversy and raised questions about the direction and integrity of the franchise. I don't know if anyone would have thought there might have been a lot there with integrity, but when they sold it, and when they started doing bum fights too, at that point, it did feel a little bit different. I think, I, I don't remember specifically if I had known that they had sold it at that point in time, but I remember hearing about bum fights too. And, and having seen part, like some clips of the very first volume and realizing that it was just street fights about people like who I don't care about. And like, even like the homeless stunt stuff was like, whatever, it just didn't really seem to be this like massive draw for at least me or any of my friends. Now I can't say other people didn't bite. Obviously people did because three more volumes came out, but it's again, it's something that's probably going to have a fair amount of diminishing returns especially because this kind of made its way into some serious legal trouble. In April 2006, the four original filmmakers of Bump Fights, McPherson, Bubeck, Tanner, and Sliman, found themselves facing a lawsuit. The lawsuit alleged that the videos violated the rights of the three homeless men who were depicted in the series. And just as the case was about to go to trial, they settled. Part of the settlement agreement, the filmmakers agreed to cease production and distribution of bum fights videos 
They also agreed to provide compensation to the homeless individuals featured in those videos. What you have to remember about this is that Rufus and Donnie and the other guy, they didn't get anything out of the sales that were made uh, featuring their merch or their faces for the merch featuring anything about them. They didn't make any money. You know, some of the reports were saying that McPherson gave him beer money occasionally or bought him some food occasionally. But you figure if this the entire thing is pulling in literally millions of dollars, that is something that could have easily set those guys up for life or at least set them up for a while to get on the right track. But they didn't do that. And that's one of the reasons why this lawsuit happened. This legal settlement marked a significant turning point for the franchise. It signaled the end of the original creator's involvement in bump fights and the closure of that chapter in their lives. The series had become synonymous with controversy and ethical debates, and its creators decided to distance themselves from its future. I mean, they were kind of forced out, to be fair, but it would be for the best for them to do that. And when the settlement was complete, the franchise, as I mentioned before, was sold to Ty Beeson and Ray Letitia, who then ventured forward without McPherson or any of the other creators. So what happened after Bum Fights? What was McPherson's post-Bum Fights journey? Here's where things take a turn and get really wild. So after the settlement and the sale of Bum Fights, McPherson found himself at a crossroads. The series had become a lightning rod for controversy, and he sought to move on to new ventures. Las Vegas presented an opportunity for a fresh start and a chance to explore different creative avenues. In Las Vegas, McPherson ventured into various projects, aiming to distance himself from the notoriety associated from bum fights. He continued to be involved in the world of filmmaking, exploring different genres and artistic expressions. One notable project that emerged during this time was In Decline Volume 1, It's Worse Than You Think. This was a reality video that showcased graffiti art, street crime, people with mental disabilities, and skateboarding segments. It deviated from the focus on homeless individuals that had characterized bum fights and took on more of a politically progressive and socially conscious tone. This new project allowed McPherson to channel his creative energy into exploring different societal issues and expressing his views through visual media. While In Decline Volume 1 received attention, it didn't encounter any of the legal troubles or public outcry that had hindered the Bump Fight series. There was a whole bunch of media coverage on the graffiti art and things like that, and it looked to be pretty funny and, you know, pretty kind of mid-2000s street art, everyone's trying to be a Banksy type situation, but still it didn't feature homeless guys, you know, beating each other up, which also never happened. But so, yeah, people weren't going to be paying much attention to it. And in fact, actually, during this time, the Indecline website experienced temporary shutdowns and then reappearances. The ebb and flow and online presence added to the enigmatic nature surrounding his work and kept his audience intrigued. However, McPherson's journey in Las Vegas wasn't without his challenges and setbacks. His production house, now called Shoot to Kill Media, vanished temporarily, but then later resurfaced under the new name Critical Focus. Now, Shoot to Kill Media is an interesting avenue. It's a bunch of like music videos that have a bunch of dark and macabre visuals to them. Uh, I can only assume probably like local Las Vegas talent is, is what's being filmed here. And I watched a couple of the videos and they were okay. They were, they were pretty, pretty well done. Critical focus, on the other hand, is really interesting because you can tell at this point he doesn't want to be associated with with bum fights at all. There's actually a video that he directed with like uh blue man group and like piff the magic dragon. And I think like some people from Cirque de LA and whatever. And it's all about this, um, you know, this event in Vegas. And it's a really well done stylized video. Louis Anderson is in it and they shot it in like four hours, very quick, very dirty. I watched the whole thing. And it's impressive. His filmmaking work is actually impressive, but you can tell that even though there is this, you know, very professionalized, somewhat maybe macabre angle to it, it definitely is meant to be a far cry from what he was most known for. And the dude right now is 39 years old. So obviously he is wanting to, you know, maybe hit that second stage of his life 
where the dumb stuff that he did when he was younger maybe won't follow him around forever. And I totally get that. But look, despite the efforts to establish new identity and explore different creative venues, McPherson's connections to bum fights and the controversies surrounding it continue to cast a shadow over his work. The legacy of the video series loomed large and impacted how his subsequent projects were received and interpreted. And yeah, and that is one reason why when we are now going to talk about the Thailand incident, you can maybe see why people reacted the way that they did. So in November 2014, McPherson, along with his former Bum Fights co-creator Daniel Tanner, found themselves embroiled in a bizarre and macabre incident in Thailand. The pair were detained by Thai police after attempting to ship human remains back to the United States. The shocking discovery of five boxes containing a baby's head, a baby's right foot, sheets of tattooed human skin, and even a murder victim's heart sent shockwaves through the local media. The circumstances surrounding the Thailand incident were murky and raised numerous questions. McPherson and Tanner claimed that they had stumbled upon the body parts at a Bangkok night market and decided to send them as a prank to friends back in the United States. However, this implausible explanation did little to quell suspicions surrounding their involvement. I mean, yeah, you fucking think? It's one of those scenarios where I can't see the humor in sending back, like, dead baby's head. Maybe the tattooed human. I'll, I'll say the tattooed stuff, because that's popped up in other media before. And that's like, look, this guy's dead. Here's a piece of tattooed flesh. Ha 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 ha. It's, it's macabre. It's macabre. I'll admit, it's macabre. I wouldn't do it myself, but I can, I can acknowledge the very, very dark humor in that. But the murder victim's heart, a baby's right foot, again, the head, definitely not something that I would, uh, I, could, I could really explain or defend in any real circumstances. Now, the Thai authorities launched their own investigation into the origin of the body parts, and it did not take them to a night market. CCTV footage emerged, and it became clear that McPherson and Tanner had entered and left a hospital's medical museum with large backpacks on the same day the items were reported stolen. The stolen specimens resembled those displayed in the museum, which showcased preserved remains of fetuses and organs with traumatic injuries. As the investigation progressed, McPherson and Tanner became the subject of international attention. News outlets, true crime enthusiasts, guilty, and the public at large were captivated by the extraordinary nature of the case. The incident blurred the lines between McPherson's controversial past of bump fights and his potential involvement in criminal activities. We still don't know why he did this. We still don't know why they snuck in to a hospital's medical museum and stole these parts. We still have no freaking idea. And even the Thai authorities probably still to this day have no idea. Because despite the severity of the allegations, McPherson and Tanner were released by the authorities without charges. The legal technicalities surrounding the incident left many perplexed and fueled speculation about possible corruption or external influences at play. Once they were released by the cops, the two of them bounced out of Thailand hardcore. They straight dipped into Cambodia and then used that as a way to get back to the United States without any kind of detaining or any kind of legal trouble or anything like that. But it wasn't like the incident didn't have its consequences, even though critical focus is still doing its thing. A lot of people can Google Ryan McPherson, and this is like the first story that pops up. And I'll fully admit, I knew who this guy was. I knew who Bum Fights was. It wasn't until I was on Reddit and I happened to see the stolen baby parts thing pop up that it just kind of piqued my interest to dive in and really find out more. And this is something that is going to follow this guy around for the rest of his life. But to be fair, it kind of feels like it's been moved past him. You know, I mean, look, the incident, it kind of feels like it's come and gone. It's been nine years, no arrests, no deportation. He's been able to move on and do bigger stuff. I mean, yeah, Hollywood and entertainment have a way of kind of 
forgiving people's past crimes, provided the output is good. So this might be something to consider. But still, the incident became a focal point for critics who have used it as ammunition to vilify McPherson and question his moral character. In the years that followed the Thailand incident, McPherson retreated from public eye, now keeping a low profile. He has resurfaced in Las Vegas, where he revived his original Bum Fights production studio. He also reignited his In Decline studio, which released a video focusing on culture jamming billboard vandals. And that's the one I was referring to earlier. I just got my times mixed up. That's actually pretty interesting and that's edgy and it's a victimless crime to be fair, but he is trying to send a message and, and it is still better than, you know, like having a, a drunk homeless guy run headfirst into a, a crate. When I get to the end of the story and I'm thinking about bum fights as a whole, it really is this, like, I don't want to say isolated element of internet history, but it goes to show you that people are always going to be drawn to what could be seen as counterculture. They're going to be drawn to alternative forms of entertainment, whether it is glorifying violence or glamorizing sex. Those are two elements of our, of our, of our species that are just there. They're ever present. We like both. We do. We like both. I keep thinking back to like the Coliseum and watching gladiators just brutalize and murder everybody. And that was a cultural pastime like baseball during the Roman reign. You know what I mean? It's just like the Roman empire, like that kind of stuff is always going to be a thing. It's one of the reasons why football is, is really popular here in the States. It's just, again, glamorizing violence, but because he did it with, with the homeless people. And even then it was just like, here's five bucks, go run your head into a wall or, or, or do this. It ends up being looked at negatively because he is taking advantage of underprivileged people and adding to very much a mindset that can, you know, have negative impacts. And I mean, I'm glad we're 20 years past it, but it's just such an interesting snapshot of our time. And, I, and I'm just kind of curious new, your guys' thoughts on this one. So if you guys haven't already, head over to deeplore.tv. You can find the article. You can leave your comments there. Deep Lore TV at YouTube, Deep Lore TV on Twitter, Deep Lore TV on Instagram, and on TikTok. Man, it's everywhere. Just Google it. You guys are going to find it. If you guys want to support the podcast, best way to do that is head on over to patreon.com forward slash Matt Jarbo. Help out. And I will talk to you all next week for another episode of Deep Lore. Thank you again. Have yourself a great day and peace out.